Tonight is a Christmas message, simple, and it's also a message of divine faith. The title is, When You Look Into the Manger, What Do You See? The starting scripture will be found in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was new, no room for them in the inn. When you look into the manger this Christmas season, will you look with spiritual vision? Will you look and see more than just a little baby? Will you see as God desires you to see? For the past 2,000 years, multitudes have looked into the manger and unfortunately were blind to what God desired them to see. Even in society today, people look into the manger and they see a cute little baby. Others look and they see a little baby named Jesus who is called the Son of God and for a brief season each year, they'll go to church, listen to the story of his birth, and sing Christmas carols. To so many, the Christ child is just a story. His value to them, no more than print on paper. However, there is so much more to this little baby lying in a manger. For what people fail to see is the greatest price ever paid. For the greatest gift ever given. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When looking into the manger, there is so much to see. But over the years, people have been blinded by ignorance and false religions, and they cannot see their salvation and eternal life. Others have looked, and they're so consumed with lust, selfishness, and the cares of life that they refuse to see freedom from the bondage of sin and power in divine blood to make them new, soul, mind, and body. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now before Jesus came to earth, under the law of Moses, the law required that the sacrifice of animal blood be made for the pardon of people's sins in the eyes of God. For Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. The requirements under the law for a sacrificial offering for sin was very strict. The sacrifice must be a male lamb of the first year, and the lamb was to be perfect, without blemish or spot. However, the law of Moses in this sacrifice of animal blood was weak and ineffective, in that there was no power in these to give people victory over sin. Under the law, people would receive pardon for their sin. However, their sinful nature remained within them. So once they received pardon, eventually they would go right back into their sins. And this is why, by the grace of God, divine blood came into the world in the form of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, God the Father would provide his own sacrifice for sins on behalf of the human race, that whosoever would believe upon him and the sacrifice would be saved. Jesus' sacrifice of divine blood would provide a person a born-again experience power over all sin and sickness, abundant life on earth, and eternal life in heaven. For Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Jesus willingly came into the world to be this special sacrifice and provide these supernatural benefits for the human race. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, then verse 9 through 12, we see God and the Son in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said he, meaning Jesus, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Yes, Jesus came, he fulfilled the law and the prophets, and at Calvary he established a new dispensation, a grace dispensation by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. When Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, People in that day looked upon the baby and saw differently. Some saw a cute little baby, helpless, defenseless, totally dependent on mother. Others looked and they saw a little one destined to be a carpenter in the future, like his earthly father Joseph. And then others saw just another little baby born to be a poor slave under cruel Roman bondage. Yet for a few, it was vastly different because they chose to look past his physical appearance and surrounding circumstances and see the child through the eyes of divine faith. For instance, Mary, his mother, looked into the manger and saw a holy child conceived of the Holy Ghost who is the Son of the Highest, and of His kingdom there shall be no end. Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 33, and verse 35. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David." And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Joseph, the earth father, he too looked into the manger and saw a child conceived of the Holy Ghost. His name to be Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. At the birth of Jesus, it was no coincidence that God would send angels to announce his birth to shepherds in that very region of Bethlehem. Also giving these shepherds a sign, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. For you see, everything that is done in the will of God is done on purpose, for a special reason. From Jesus' birthplace, to the announcement by the angels to the shepherds, even to the very sign given to the shepherds. In the Old Testament, the prophet Micah prophesied of Jesus' birth and birthplace 700 years prior to it happening. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, 
Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Then in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Now, in Bethlehem is located only a few miles from Jerusalem. And Bethlehem was a city known in that day throughout Israel to be synonymous with sacrificial lambs. History tells us there was a region just outside the city of Bethlehem where Passover lambs were birthed and kept by specially trained and purified shepherds. The reason, because this area was so nigh unto Jerusalem, where the Passover lambs would be sacrificed in the temple at Jerusalem. In this region of Bethlehem sat a tower known as Migdal Eder. This was a watchtower where the priestly shepherds would watch over their flocks in the field. And at the base, within this tower, is where the birthing of the sacrificial lambs took place. Now, the common practice by these priestly shepherds would be at the birth of a lamb, the shepherds would immediately take the lamb and inspect it. Once inspected, the lamb would either be certified for use as a sacrificial lamb in the temple at Jerusalem, or be designated to be released for common use. Then, the shepherd would take the sacrificial lamb, and would wrap it in swaddling clothes and lay it in a manger filled with soft hay for the first few hours of its life. Now this was done to protect the lamb, to keep the lamb from kicking, thrashing around, or falling down, and avoid any chance that the lamb might break a bone or bruise itself, which would immediately disqualify it from being used as a sacrifice. Remember, these lambs had to be perfect. Then once calm, the sacrificial lamb would be returned to its mother, and it would receive special care from that point forward by the shepherd priests. That is, until the time arrived when it would be made a sacrifice in the temple at Jerusalem. Now, the prophet Micah not only prophesied of Jesus' birthplace, Bethlehem. He also prophesied of the tower Migdal Eder, and that one would come forth from there to establish an everlasting kingdom in Jerusalem. Micah chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, the Lord speaking of Israel, In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, this special sacrifice, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem." Again, I repeat, it was no coincidence or chance that the angels would appear to the shepherds in this region of Bethlehem. For the shepherds of this area, they had been trained under the law for this very moment. They knew that one day a Messiah would come to deliver the people. 
So when the angels announce glad tidings of great joy to all people, for a Savior is born, which is Christ the Lord, these shepherds would recognize the significance of the sign given by the angels and understand just how this one would be the Savior of the world. For when these shepherds looked into the manger, they would see the perfect Lamb of God, wrapped in swaddling clothes, who was born to die for the sins of all the people. Later, when Mary and Joseph took little Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to be circumcised, there met them a man named Simeon, who waited for the consolation of Israel, for the Holy Ghost was with him. And to him it was revealed by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death until his eyes beheld the Christ child. Now when Simeon met the parents in the temple, he took baby Jesus into his arms and he beheld God's salvation, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. Then there were three wise men, from the Far East that traveled two years from the time of Jesus' birth, following the miracle star as it led them to the child. And in traveling for two years, these three men sacrificed much, time, finances, their families, their comforts, and yes, I'm sure at times, their safety. And when they finally reached their destination, and they looked upon this young child in the midst of modest surroundings. They beheld the king of the Jews, each one coming before Jesus to bow down and worship, each one presenting their gift unto him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All of these witnesses were given on purpose to be voiced throughout the region and countryside throughout as a testimony. And still, most people in that day failed to see what God was trying to show them. For they looked upon Jesus with only earthly vision, ideas, and opinions. And they would not look upon this child with spiritual vision of divine faith. And today it's the same. More of the same. People continue to look into the manger with their own ideas and opinions failing to look through divine faith, failing to see as God would have them see. For many people, Christmas is just another holiday, another reason to take time off from work, to gather with family and friends, to celebrate with the exchanging of gifts, and have a good time. For others, Christmas is big business as people spend and spend and spend, even going into debt to celebrate. And in this day and age, it's becoming more and more difficult to even find Christmas cards that properly recognize and honor Jesus Christ. But this is done on purpose because the spirit of Antichrist is manifesting itself, seeking to take Jesus out of Christmas by people that refuse to look into the manger. Friend, listening to this message, by television or radio, when you look into the manger, are you seeing everything that God desires you to see? In the manger, do you see the ultimate sacrifice? Jesus came to this earth, having never been separated from his heavenly Father. He came to this earth knowing the price he would have to pay, knowing that he was God's perfect sacrificial lamb. Jesus left his place in heaven to live in a sin-cursed world, he shed off his power and glory to live in a body of flesh and be bound by all its weaknesses and limitations. As the Son of Man, he had to eat and sleep. He grew tired and weary. He felt pain and sorrow. And he was subject to all temptations as we are. Yet he was victorious. Living in a body of flesh, he had to learn obedience through suffering. For him, it was necessary to receive the Holy Ghost, to pray and fast that the power of God might work through him. 
Oh, such sacrifice, to lay aside such great glory and power in heaven, to come down into a sin-cursed world and live as a poor, lowly servant with no place to call home and no pillow to lay his head. At Calvary, God's perfect sacrificial lamb would then bear upon himself all the sins and all the sicknesses of the human race. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 7. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus' sacrifice was not made under any penalty of wrongdoing or obligation. It was made of his own free choice. It was made in love for you and me. For we are the ones that profit from his sacrifice. The nation of Israel, in their greatest hour of visitation, refused to behold the Lamb of God, to see their salvation, their King, their Christ. Matthew chapter 27, verses 22, 24, and 25. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And as a result of their stubbornness and spiritual blindness, the blood of Christ has been upon the Jewish people for 2,000 years. And what a price they have had to pay. Take another look into the manger right now. Do you see a miracle child lying there? Do you see a holy child born of a virgin? So many like Israel 2,000 years ago, stubbornly refused to look in the manger and see as they should because they continue to deny the virgin birth of Christ. And by doing so, they are denying the power of the Holy Ghost. They are denying the power of divine blood. In fact, they are denying Jesus, his divinity. No wonder so many churches are spiritually weak and lukewarm. They have no power in their midst. It's only a form of godliness. Again, look into the manger. Do you see the shadow of the cross hovering over this little baby lying there? God's perfect lamb, holy, without spot, blemish, or any such thing. God's perfect lamb, born to die, that we may live forever. Friend, one day soon, Jesus will return to earth to rapture his bride into heaven. And his bride is a people from all over the world and from all walks of life. His bride is a glorious church who have lived their lives on earth as Jesus lived his, according to the will of God, without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing a perfect bride for the perfect Lamb of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, speaking of Jesus, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. To be made so pure, so holy, so undefiled, can only be through God's love gift to the human race. God gave Jesus... Divine blood was spilled at Calvary that sins would be washed away and eternal life received. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, open your heart's door right now and accept God's love gift to you this very moment. Let the power in the blood of Jesus wash away all of your sins. Pray this prayer with me and mean it from your heart. Say, O oh God, I confess all of my sin before you. Forgive me, Lord, and I will serve you the rest of my life. And I believe there is power in the blood of Jesus that washes away all of my sins. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, Jesus. And friend, if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. You have received the gift of salvation and eternal life. And friend, there is power in the blood, not only for salvation for the soul, eternal life for the soul, there's power in divine blood that gives healing and life to the body. Jesus said a believer in his name would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And I'm the Lord's believer. Friend, if you're sick in body, if you are in pain, put your hand against mine on the screen as a form of laying on of hands. You listening by way of radio, put your hand on your listening device. Let the power in the blood of Jesus do for you what no other power can do. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring this people before you. God, you made that great sacrifice on purpose that they might have healing for their body. Lay a healing hand upon each one in the holy blood name of Jesus. Heal, heal, heal. Let that blood power flow. Lord, deliver, set free, and make them whole. For the honor and glory of your son, Jesus. And amen. Friend, watch every improvement. Give God the honor, the praise, and the glory. And write, contact us. Let us know what God did for you. And if you are without the Holy Ghost, friend, I encourage you that through Jesus Christ, God not only provided the human race the gifts of salvation, healing, and eternal life, through Jesus we are offered the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. For it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And if you've received the gift of salvation, go forth now, it's time to receive, to open your heart's door and accept the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to call this anointing down upon you, friend. And when this anointing comes down, start praising the Lord. Open that heart's door and praise Him with all your heart and mind. Use that word glory in your praises. And as you do, the power of the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And when it does, the Holy Ghost will come in. And when He does come in, He will take over your tongue. And he will turn those praises into another language. And he will speak through you. It will be by his power and his utterance. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring the people before you. God, anoint them to receive the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Friend, praise the Lord. And don't stop till the Holy Ghost comes in. God bless.